What is going on in American society? We have a political party that won the vote three years ago, has responsibility to fill the su su Supreme Court with his pick for justice, and another party threatening to stack the court on the other side of the election if they come into power and add as many liberals as it takes who will summarily ignore the Constitution. This is about as close to civil war as, as a country can get without actually being in one. We have a former CNN reporter threatening to burn down the country if Trump moves to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg. These are educated people. These are not what you would typically think of as people who've lost their sanity and uh, are out there on the fringe. These are people who are informed, educated, respectable, and it's deteriorated to this point. We have Christians who are praising one of the most demonic women of our age. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was complicit in the murder of at least 20 million children. What is a Christian to think? Welcome back to the Reformed Rant, where we take up some of the most pressing theological, philosophical, and social issues of the day without regard for pagan values and sensibilities from a distinctly Reformed Christian perspective. Our effort, our goal is to help Christians think better about these issues and to defend the faith as they engage people who actually hold to views that are opposed to the knowledge of Christ. Today's subject is the great deconstruction of Christianity and America and Christianity's complicity in that deconstruction. All right, buckle up. This is going to be another exciting Reformed rant episode. How should we as Christians think about it? What is the, the role of the church um, in our country as it stands today? We have, we have a problem with nearsightedness, and every culture has this problem. It's difficult for us to look beyond the culture that we are in and to come up with a perspective that isn't so infected and tainted by what's right in front of us. And what's right in front of Christians, and I'm talking about true Christians, I'll have to qualify this as I go along, um, is the idea that uh, the American experiment was founded on uh, principles derived from Christianity, derived from the Bible, a morality that's anchored in principles derived from Christianity. Not perfectly, but um, when you, relatively speaking, when you compare the founding of this country and the principles upon which it was founded with the rest of the world, it's remarkably different. It is unique. I don't know of another country that is even close to being founded upon the same kind of principles, excluding Israel. That's changing. That, that isn't changing. That has changed. It's, it has shifted. Uh, and now we see America aligning more with <clears throat> other countries, the principles that other countries may hold to, other societies may hold to around the world. And the reason for that is the influx of people from other countries. It's interesting to me that people come to America, they want to come to America, and they get here and they want to change it as if it's inferior to where they came from which is really mind-boggling because I, I don't want to go to Russia. I don't want to go to China. I don't care what kind of economic opportunities there might be. 
if I were to hold the, a unique skill set that was prized by those countries, I still would have zero interest going there. Nevertheless, it is what it is. So <clears throat> what is happening in our, in our society right now? We have what I call the great deconstruction of both Christianity and America. And because America is founded on principles derived from Christian doctrine, from the Bible, the two are kind of married, sort of. They're very closely related. We don't want to we don't want to make the mistake of thinking they're synonymous because they're not. Uh, now, to say that, I want to make this clear, just because I say that America uh, is founded on principles derived from Christianity, that's not the same thing as saying America is a Christian nation. It's not the same thing as thinking that America is like Israel of the Old Testament. Far too many Christians uh, actually use Old Testament scriptures to prop up America and to fight for and defend uh, America. Uh, and I, I think that's a huge mistake. It's wrongheaded. The Old Testament, Israel, was a type of church. So when we look into the Old Testament and we see inside the nation of Israel, you should immediately think, I'm stepping inside the church. This is these principles and these structures and this thinking is really something that is is um, dimly reflecting the church from the Old Testament to the New Testament. This is why I, I I get frustrated when I hear people go into the Old Testament, especially social justice warriors, and they start talking about justice for society. And they, they extrapolate that out of the community of faith and think that it is to be applied to uh, the entire society or to American government more specifically. Uh, this is a hermeneutical uh, misstep big time, and it leads to lots of problems. So what's happening? Number one. The view of those who want to deconstruct American society is that the Constitution, you aren't hearing this yet, but you're going to. And I, I think we're incredibly close. Probably some people are saying it that I haven't heard yet. Uh, but we're right on the, we're on the precipice of this, this actually coming at this point. The Constitution is going to be held by these people. They believe it right now. It's a racist document created by racists. Its very existence is oppressive. Right? because of the mindset of the people who put it together. All right? So when you are having a, a conversation with someone and you're alarmed that the Constitution is, is under attack, you need to understand they don't think about the Constitution the same way you do. All right? And I think this is a problem in... Uh, a lot of people in the black community because they uh, may see the Constitution this way as well. It's a racist document created by racists, and it's oppressive. So we have to get rid of it. The framers of the Constitution represented a form, this is number two, a form of Christianity that was racist and oppressive as well. So the two go hand in hand. This is why you see the deconstruction of both right of both they're kind of intertwined in order to really dismantle the constitution you've got to get rid of those supporters those those strong advocates for that document first and we've seen this happening in especially the southern baptist convention and some other evangelical uh groups where the the constitution, the, not the constitution, the, the idea of racism is like the worst sin in the world. Uh, there, are, there can't be a worse sin than, than racism. The idea of slavery, oppression, and so forth. You've seen the, the path cleared 
by these people so that they can get to the Constitution. Now, they want to get to the Constitution. They want to dismantle Christianity. And you're going to ask maybe the question, I've asked the question, what's really happening here? What's the dry, What's the, the end game? And I believe that the end game isn't necessarily the Constitution in and of itself, but what the Constitution does. The Constitution stands in the way of certain worldviews that want power, want to control, want to change the very society, the very fabric of the society in which we live. And at the heartbeat of that change is a hatred for the true biblical worldview of Christianity. That is the end game. Destroy Christianity. That restraining influence that Christianity brings to bear on things like sexual behavior, eliminate it, get rid of it. Once that happens, they can begin to uh, increase the level of, or let's say, sink into a level of immorality that we have yet to see. And we've seen some some pretty repugnant immorality going on in our society right now. All right. So the principles upon which America was founded are racist, oppressive, and morally repugnant. That's the thinking of the progressive liberal worldview. Okay. Now you may run into people who are in that camp, uh, but not quite as informed as others are and may innocently think that's not the case. Uh, but it's the only reason they think that's not the case is because they're completely disconnected from what's going on. Um, think of it like this. Maybe someone who was raised supporting the Democratic Party who've just continued to hold on to their idea of what that party was like 50 years ago. That's gone 60 years ago, 70 years ago. <laughs> we have to go back quite a ways at this point. So both the Constitution and the Christ Christian principles upon which it was built must go. Okay, This is why uh, when you look at the, the, the denominations like the SBC, which is really not a denomination per se, not, not in the standard sense, this is why you saw men like Edwards and Whitfield attacked. It's why you saw MLK 50, okay? This is why you see the destruction of monuments and statues of American history being dismantled and destroyed, right? They represent an ideology and worldview that is antithetical to what these people want to establish, okay? It's kind of like, losing a war without even fighting one. <clears throat> That's what it feels like at this point. The attack started against Christianity, right, with the social justice, with the woke and all of this. It started inside Christianity and has exploded uh, everywhere else. First of all, convince Christians that these theologians and the idea of Christianity that they've uh, been trained in is actually false. This isn't the Jesus of the Bible. These are, if you talk to these people, they have their Bible doesn't consist of Genesis to Revelation. Their Bible is bits and pieces of the Old Testament, theocracy, theonomy, bits and pieces. And in the New Testament, pretty much uh, the Sermon on the Mount lifted out of context and that's it. As for the rest of the Bible, you never, ever hear them talking about it. <clears throat> and that, that hermeneutic is used to supposedly paint the picture of who the true Jesus was and what the true Jesus was really all about. And they will take texts of Scripture, sayings of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount, and they will apply a wooden, overly literal interpretation to that text 
and ins- and use it, use it to support their agenda. Now, what happens when you insist on taking that even that literal interpretation of what Jesus says and applying it to them? They run because they don't apply those texts to themselves consistently. You see, this is a ruse. It is a tool. It is a weapon. It is not, I sincerely believe the teachings of Jesus and want them want to apply them to my life because, as we'll see in a moment, if that were the case, when we get into the Sermon on the Mount, there are principles in the Sermon on the Mount that, and I'm not going to cover the Sermon on the Mount. I just made it sound like I, I am. I'm not. But when you get into that pericope, that section of Scripture, and you see the things Jesus talked about, what becomes glaring to me is that if you really understand what Christ is doing there in that discourse, your social justice movement, your social justice gospel falls apart. It loses all of its basis in just the Sermon on the Mount. You don't have to go anywhere else. The Sermon on the Mount is enough fodder, rightly understood, to completely and totally dismantle the social justice movement. And you'll see that in a second. All right. Now, the next step is once you've taken down the 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 men that the church look up to, men like Edwards and Whitfield and so forth, by accusing them of being racist, and you, we've already established that the pagans have now made racism the very worst sin ever. You can butcher babies. You can stick a you can stick a you can stick scissors in the brain of an infant and suck out those brains, and that is not as bad as calling someone a certain name. When I was a kid growing up, we were taught, you know, six and stones might break my bones. Names will never, words will never hurt me, right? Not so much now. It's been elevated to the, it's been elevated to treason, the highest crime you could ever commit. Once you buy into that, now they have the weapon they need to manipulate your behavior. You don't want to be called a racist, do you? Homosexuals did the same thing with the word bigot. And our our leaders just aren't strong enough, seemingly, uh, to stand up to this stuff and push back because they're afraid that the slightest bit of pushback is going to offend people in the churches and and, uh, they're going to leave. And that's especially true with black people in, in the churches. I'm sorry, but uh, you have to take a stand for the truth. And if you really love the people that are under you, you've got to find a way to help them think better. And and I, I'm not saying I have all the answers to that. I am saying that the the one thing I do know is the answer to that is not to be quiet. That's not the answer, right? You have to find a better way to do this. I'm convinced f- strong discipleship a strong discipleship program, program, I hate to use the word program, structure, framework, is necessary to combat this stuff. If we want to equip the saints, we want to love them and help them think in a way that honors and glorifies God, we've got to find a way to address it. We've got to get to it somehow. We can't let it sit. That's not loving people. Okay, so what is a Christian to do? Well, let's just walk through this. Because I want to, I want, I'm speaking as a Christian, okay? That's another part of the problem, guys. You get in these conversations, you get in, you, you come up on this topic, and you're having this conversation, and you forget that, uh, wait a minute, <laughs> we're Christians. We are the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth. We are possessors of truth, and we are being, uh, kind of manipulate, not kind of, we are being manipulated and moved around by the world, right? Now, uh, in my devotions this morning, I was reading the Sermon on the Mount, 
And I came across this, these two verses. And I thought about, gosh, this, this, this really, I mean, this, this is Jesus' doctrine of total depravity. And uh, it's Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 and 23. Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, not probably that, word, that rendering clear, opens up some room for confusion, misunderstanding, right? You really need to look at the original language to, to see that the word is um, aplus, the Greek word aplus, right? And that word does not mean uh, clear. It means sincere, without guile, good, morally. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is morally good, your whole body will be full of light. Well, how does the eye become morally good? In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Paul said that the God of this world has blinded their eyes so that they can't see. So if you're an unregenerate person, you cannot have good eyes. You cannot have sincere eyes without guile. Your eyes are bad. They're bad. Now, if the eye is bad... Verse 23, but if your eye is bad, Jesus said, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, he goes on to say. We, as the church, have fallen into the trap of allowing those who have bad eyes establish our morality. And in, the, in this area of social justice, of equality, the idea has become privilege gaps, the privilege gap, I'll call, I call it the privilege gap. The privilege gap has to be eliminated. Or... If you want to contend with that, maybe we say it like this. There is an acceptable level of privilege to which every human being is entitled. And if they don't have that level of privilege, that's injustice. And if you allow them to sit below that level and you don't do anything about it, then you're not loving your neighbor. And if you don't love your neighbor, you don't love God. This is the argument that's being made, guys. It is a tool, it is a weapon, it is manipulation at its finest. And we, rather than push back on it, have given in. We've succumbed to it. Basically. Excuse my my cell phone. Uh, Apparently, one of my friends doesn't know that I'm in the middle of a rant. All right, let's let's continue. Why do I say that this deconstruction that is based on a social justice gospel is neither just nor the gospel? Well, first of all, the social justice movement itself is not just. And the standard by which we determine whether or not a thing is just is Scripture. It's the nature of God as it is revealed to us in Scripture. It isn't just because it falsely accuses people of a particular sin, namely privilege. When you 
strip it all away, you see this idea of being white as a privilege, uh, white men as a privilege. Uh, the system is stacked to favor white men. Um, now, you know, I'm going to leave aside, I'm not going to argue about whether or not that's true. I, I really don't care if that's true. Again, I'm speaking as a Christian. And if you want to argue that it, it is uh, a Christian practice to go out into the pagan world and create equality for everybody, well, then you're going to have to come up with an argument from the Bible to support that. And the only way you can do that is by employing an extremely flawed, indefensible hermeneutic, which can be ripped apart. You cannot lift bits and pieces of Scripture from the theonomy, from the theocracy, which operated with as a as uh, uh, with a theonomy outlook because it was the community of faith. The law of God governed the community of faith, just like it governs the community of faith today. So, privilege in and of itself to be born into a system where your citizenship or your status in that system is ipso facto privileged is not a sin to be repented of. If you're a Christian and you live in that society, well, that puts you in a position to actually do some good, right? Think about uh, being rich in this world and the good that you can do. The Bible does not command you not to be rich. It doesn't command you to give up your, your wealth. What Paul does say to the rich is not to be arrogant. It's funny how arrogance and high-mindedness accompany being wealthy. Being wealthy is a very spiritually, uh, and I'm speaking as a Christian. I'm just going to keep saying this. Being wealthy is a very dangerous thing as a Christian. It's extremely dangerous. It's like, uh, think about this. It's like a pastor of a church who is, and we've seen this throughout history. I mean, this, this is just a nature of being a man. It's like a pastor of a church who is incredibly gifted, articulate, talented, comes across as caring, sensitive, and he's extremely good looking. That's dangerous for that guy. And he will tell you, if he's a godly man, he will tell you that's dangerous. In fact, he doesn't even have to be all of those things. Most pastors will tell you this is a, that that occupation is a hazard when it comes to sexual sin because there are sinful women in every church who will look at a man like that and the temptations are everywhere. In the same way, being wealthy as a, as a Christian is a dangerous thing. It's dangerous. But it isn't a sin. It is not a sin. If you listen to social justice advocates, it would almost seem as if having money, being privileged, having a status where you can do good is in and of itself a sin. And here's the other thing. It is, it is incredibly arrogant for these, these guys like Russell Moore and other SBC leaders, J.D. Greer and, and David Platt and, and Chandler and you know, all these guys. It's incredibly arrogant for them to come along and fix the standard by which you should live out your convictions in terms of, of money. Paul, in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, laid out the principles of Christian giving to that church. And the, and the people that were recipients of the gift were going to die without it. The, the need was genuine. The need was genuine. And that's the assumption, always the assumption. When Jesus talks about if someone comes to you to borrow or someone to ask you for help, the assumption, which these guys like to leave off, 
the assumption is that the need is genuine. Okay? You don't need cable television in your home. You don't need a television. You really don't need a phone. The things that we think we need in this country is amazing. We don't need them. They're nice to have. They're good to have. But we don't need them. We don't need computers. We don't need email. We don't need a ton of the stuff that we have. I don't need guitars. I don't need them. So we have to understand that when we're talking about these issues, these are genuine needs, real needs, that are life-threatening, life-changing needs. Okay. Second, it isn't just because it claims all slavery is sin. The social justice movement is not a just movement, not just because it says slavery is sin. I should say it isn't just. Back up. That word "just" maybe I need to maybe I need to change "just" because "just" can be uh, mean more than one thing. The social justice movement is not a just movement itself because it claims that slavery is ipso facto a sin. Now, when people hear me say this. Uh, they just they cringe, and I, I understand why they cringe. I understand that people insist on believing that all slavery is a sin. I understand that, and I understand how unpopular it is to say that that thinking is wrong. My interest, again, is not the defense of slavery. It isn't even the defense of of American slavery, the Atlantic slave trade. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm going all the way back 2,000 years ago when the Apostle Paul treated slave owners like Christians and never demanded that they repent. And you need to understand something. If you're not on this page, here's my concern. Christianity was painted a certain way by homosexuals as hateful bigots in order to get as many Christians as possible, to let go of the idea that homosexuality was ipso facto a sin. Bigots, 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 bigots. And then what happened? People changed their Christianity. Right? If you, will, if you, if you do this also with slavery, slavery is a sin, it's racist, racist, oppressive, a sin, uh, so on and so forth, What's gonna, what, what, what happens is people will loosen their grip on Christianity. Now, what you don't see coming is that when we get to the New Testament, and if people take it at face value, they don't try to play around with it, and they say, you know what, it is, it is true. The Apostle Paul treated slave owners like they were genuine Christians. That is Christianity. Slavery was included in Christianity. It was it was part of the community. You could own slaves and be a Christian. What kind of religion does that? Christianity's useless. It's worthless. It's just as wicked as any other religion, just as immoral. See, when the pagans establish the morality and Christianity bends the knee, what ends up happening is now pagans have the weapons and the tools to actually dispense with Christianity altogether. And if you keep changing Christianity, trying to find a way to keep it alive, to hang on to what little bit of it the world will let you keep, you're going to turn around and not have anything left. That's my concern with this slavery argument, and it's happening right in front of your face, and you won't deal with it. You don't know how to deal with it, or you know how to deal with it, but you're afraid to deal with it because of the consequences. Look, you know, they might, they might take you to, in the public square, metaphorically, drag you there, strip you down, beat you, put you up on a, a post, put firewood underneath you, and burn you at the stake. You won't be the first. The social justice movement isn't just because it places blame on those who didn't commit the crime. It, can, it indicts and convicts 
people who didn't commit the crime. I never kidnapped a slave, but because I'm white, I'm convicted of the sin of privilege, the sin of oppression, the sin of racism, the sin of supporting a system that is inherently unequal. Even though when you ask people to go through and demonstrate the systemic inequality, they, they can't do it. They throw numbers at you like more black people are in jail than white people and more black people are pulled over than white people or, or whatever. Those things are not evidence of systemic inequality. They're observations. You have to get behind those numbers and ask other questions, second level, third level questions to understand root cause. These people will not do that because it does not support the agenda. It's a problem. All right. The social justice movement isn't just because it, it ignores justice. For starters, it defends criminals. If you look at the last half a dozen interactions where a black man was shot or killed by cops, law enforcement officers, in every single case, we're talking about not an innocent black man who was living a life uh, without any kind of problems. That has happened. I'm not denying that, that that hasn't happened. It's happened to black people. It's happened to white people. It's happened to Asian people. It's happened to Hispanic people. It has happened. The system isn't perfect. But just because that happens doesn't mean we have a crisis. Again, when it's elevated to the level of crisis... It is a weapon. It's a tool, right? It's used to prop up an agenda. Social justice movement isn't just because it defends criminals. It encourages criminal behavior when it defends criminals. When a man can come running at a cop wielding a knife and get shot, and the response of the black community and I shouldn't say black community, of some people in the black community and some people in the white community, when their response is to burn the city down, that isn't justice in any sense of the word. Even if there's a situation where a police officer wrongly shot someone, a black person, for bad reasons, it is still unjust for people to go burn down the buildings of others who had nothing to do with it. That is not justice. That is a great injustice to the owner of that business. They didn't do anything to have you come in and try to destroy their means of livelihood. The social justice movement isn't just because it lacks respect for the law. Don't talk about justice if you have no respect for the law. The social justice movement is, is not just because it ignores the payment of sin made by Christ. This is the biggest one of all. If Christ took all men's sin upon himself, that would include slavery if slavery were a sin, would it not? If privilege were a sin, it would include privilege. If Christ took that sin, then he took the guilt with it. Think about this. If, if privilege is a sin, then it has to be repented of. It's never, never ever mentioned in the Bible. If you don't think that there were privileged people in Scripture, there were Romans who were Christians in the New Testament. Paul never told them to repent of their privilege. Not one time. If Christ took that sin, then he took the guilt with it. If Christ took the guilt of slavery, if slavery were a sin, then men are no longer guilty of that sin. 
That means that if you are a black Christian and you are judging white people because of slavery from years ago, you are engaging, Christians, Christians, you are engaging in sin. Number one, you're refusing to forgive someone who didn't sin in the first place in that way. You're withholding forgiveness of someone for something they didn't even do. Second, you're withholding forgiveness of from someone of something they didn't do, and they certainly didn't do it to you. No one has. You walk out your door, and a white person beats you up, uh, assaults you, takes your stuff. As a Christian, you cannot then turn around and despise all white people because of something a white person did to you. That is sinful. When, when white people used to profile, and this happened, all black people or most black people are criminals. We called that racism, and it was, and it is. And so is this. That's why it's not just. The social justice movement isn't just because it seeks to indict men for the same sin that Christ already bore punishment. If slavery is a sin, Christ paid the penalty. And for everyone who is naming the name of Christ, who has been regenerated, they're forgiven. It is as if there is no slavery in their past, no oppression, no anything. They have been forgiven. You want to hang slavery around their neck? You want to hang uh, oppression? You want to hang, hang Jim Crow laws around the neck? of white believers, you are walking in an ungodly lifestyle. You are not walking in justice. What you are doing is unjust in every way. This is because it is unjust to punish two different people for the same violation. And Jesus has already been punished for every sin that everyone in him has ever committed or ever will commit. That's the gospel. The social justice movement isn't just because it is anchored in covetousness. When you think about it, Tim Keller said it. Tim Keller said it. We looked right past it, didn't think much about it, but he said it when he said, a white person's skin is worth a million dollars over the course of their lifetime. What is that? Hey, wait a minute. I'll tell you what it is. If white guys, if white people, if being white is worth a million dollars over the course of their life, then being black should be worth a million dollars too. We're talking about greed. We're talking about materialism. That's what we're talking about. Jesus, in that Sermon on the Mount I was talking about, commands us not to worry about our life. And that isn't just for people who have privilege or more privilege. It's for people who have less privilege. In fact, I would argue, especially for them. Of course, it's, it's funny. Those who don't have create this intense desire to have. Those who have, have this intense fear of losing what they have. So this is for both. Do not worry about your life. And Jesus was talking about basics. He wasn't talking about what we're talking about in, in our culture. We're talking about things like uh, promotions into management, CEOs of, of companies, and being, being worth a million dollars, or accumulating a million dollars, or... Uh, having having earned a million dollars over the course of one's lifetime. We're talking about silly things like that. Jesus said not to worry about food, drink, or clothing. These are basics. Basics. 
You want the Sermon on the Mount? There it is. Life is more than food and drink and what we wear, Jesus says. That goes for the wealthy, the rich, and the poor. It goes for white, black, Hispanic, Asian, you name it. Jesus not only said not to worry about these things, he then pointed out how insulting and how immoral it is to be seeking these things, which is what the social justice movement is all about. He said, the Gentiles seek after these things. Christians, we are not Gentiles spiritually any longer. Such were some of you. We should seek first the kingdom of God. Not privilege, not money, not careers, not income, not homes, not cars, not even equality in pagan society. We should seek the kingdom of God. We should not seek to dismantle pagan structures because someone has convinced us that if we love our neighbor, we're going to dismantle the system and make sure that everybody is equal. That is a weapon. It is designed to manipulate Christianity using the second greatest commandment, which does not apply to these circumstances. If I love you, I will give you a coat if you don't have one, and it's within my means to do so. I will feed you if you need bread, and it's within my means to do so. It does not mean, loving you does not mean I'm going to go out into any society and become a political activist and begin to overthrow structures and systems so that you have the same kind of equality to have greed and materialistic things that everybody else in that society has or a certain people group in that society has. That is not Christianity. That's greed. That's materialism. Jesus said these things to a people group who were far more, more oppressed in his day than black people in America are today. Here's Jesus with the Jews who were a, an oppressed, occupied people. And he's not talking about it. He's talking about how they oppress each other. Oh, don't do that. That's unloving, says Jar Jarvis Williams. Don't do that. Don't focus on that. Don't focus on their behaviors within their community because they're the ones that's being oppressed by the Romans, those nasty Romans, and Jesus isn't even talking about it. What is he talking about? He's talking about matters of the heart. If you look at the Sermon on the Mount, how do you how would you how would you summarize what the Sermon on the Mount is really doing? And that's really, I mean, that's got to be the hermeneutic that drives your study and your reading and your understanding of Matthew 5 through 7. Here it is. It's, it's really pretty simple. It was obvious that the Jews had turned law keeping into a rule book. They wanted to perfectly cross the T, perfectly dot the I. And when they did that, it made them feel good like they were doing something. But it wasn't motivated by a true love for God. It was motivated by a love for themselves. Why? They wanted to feel good about themselves. They wanted to feel righteous. They wanted to feel holy. In fact, many of them wanted to feel more righteous and more holy than others. There was a, a competition, right? This is sinful stuff, and it's common even today when you think about it. That's what's going on. And so Jesus is taking their law-keeping obsession, their self-righteousness, 
and he's peeling back that onion and showing them their wicked heart. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is doing. It's getting to the spirit of the law, the true nature of God behind the laws that he issued. God is this kind of God. Therefore, this is why that law exists. Now, let's take this home, bring this home. The social justice gospel is no gospel at all. The gospel is good news. It is the good news that there is forgiveness and redemption in Christ. Apart from Christ, we are hopeless. We cannot help ourselves. We have sinned against Almighty God, against our Creator, and we are not able to do anything to obtain forgiveness, to pay for that sin. We are helpless. We are hopeless. We stand condemned under a holy God. In Christ alone, there is forgiveness and redemption. And that exists because, first of all, Christ fulfilled the law for us. He kept the law for us perfectly. That's the righteousness that we can wear before God. It belongs to Christ. He clothes us in His righteousness. We can obtain forgiveness for our iniquities, for our sin, for our law-breaking, because God punished Christ in our place. Right? That's the gospel. The social gospel ignores both forgiveness and redemption. It does this by focusing on someone else's past. It wants to hang you. It wants to indict you. It wants to damn you for the sins of someone else or for things that aren't even sin. According to its own standard, they're sin, but not according to God's standard. In that same Sermon on the Mount, Jesus demanded that we forgive others their trespasses. It's funny, when you read the Lord's Prayer, Jesus didn't offer commentary about anything in that prayer except forgiveness. He made comments about forgiveness after he finished giving the prayer. He warned us that if we do not forgive men their trespasses, God will not forgive us our trespasses. If you love people, you better tell them that they cannot hold grudges, that they cannot hold on to their sinful thinking about the, the past of someone based purely on the color of their skin. They have some sort of physical commonality with someone who owned slaves that they think was a sin, and they're just going to impose that guilt and that sin on you, even though you didn't own slaves. This kind of thinking is antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It isn't just, and it isn't the gospel. There is no forgiveness here. There's no redemption here whatsoever. If you love people as a pastor, as a leader, as a Christian, we're all responsible. You have to find a way to lovingly help people understand this kind of thinking is sinful at its core. It's sinful at its root. And it isn't just sinful. When you look at it, I've said this beginning, I'm going to say it again as I close this out. The whole thing is designed to destroy Christianity to deconstruct biblical Christianity and to replace it with something that is no Christianity at all, no gospel at all, and something that is not just in any sense of the word justice. All right. Thank you for listening. I hope I've said something that's been beneficial, that's been encouraging, that's uh, been thought-provoking. Uh, if you have questions, comments, you can leave those at reformedreasons.com on my blog uh, or on my website. You can also go over to Reformed Reasons uh, podcast on Facebook, uh, Reformation Charlotte on Facebook, and leave comments there if you so choose. Uh, 
Continue to stand for the gospel. Continue to proclaim the gospel. Continue to place your faith in God. Don't get distracted by what is going to happen in the upcoming elections. Don't wrangle in fear. Don't 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 cower and worry that uh, we're going to lose everything. Look, the time the time is coming when that's going to happen. Uh, American society is going to go where it's going. God is sovereign. Let's continue to place our faith in God, continue to glorify Him, and trust Him. And, and more importantly than any of that, let's continue to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Let men see our good deeds. Let men hear the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Glorify God and say, come quickly, Lord Jesus.